pretty one, Ulysses. There it is. Hello, Booktube. I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. Here I am with another Friday Reads. I started four new books this week. There might have been one or two bales. Stay tuned at the end of the month. I know the suspense is killing you. I have a separate video about my reaction. I feel self-conscious doing one of these videos. I'm no literary critic like some of the other lovely uh, booktubers like Eric that uh, do these wonderful reaction videos, but I had some personal subjective reactions. So I'm not sure if that one's going up just before or just after this, but stay tuned. A couple of the books that are in progress that I started are on that long list, the Women's Prize long list. I don't think I said that before, but the Women's Prize long list. So why don't we start with those. I started Jesse Greengrass's novel, Sight, and it's on the long list for the Women's Prize. This is the one that Eric predicts will win the booker. I'm very impressed so far. I'm not that far in, 15, 20%. I really like the writing. It's dense. They're kind of Proustian, but sometimes is a negative for me, but so far not a negative here. They're gorgeously constructed. Page and a half long. Well, there, I, there's not very many paragraph breaks, and so far it's not turning me off, because usually I don't like that. Very emotionally compelling, the story of her. So far it's the story of the narrator who lost her mother. I think her father left the family, and her mother died when the narrator was only about 20 or 22. It's impossible to just pull out an excerpt. It doesn't do it justice. So I'm going to read you a probably one of the longest excerpts I have done on BookTube. It's this plus this, because nothing stands alone unless you get the whole thing. So listen to this. This is about her mother has been getting sicker and sicker, and the narrator had been living in her own flat, going to university, and this is the transition that happens. And also that they didn't have a particularly close relationship. They weren't emotionally close. We allowed practicality to stand in for compassion, and my nominal residence elsewhere acted as a boundary line, a point of principled separation. Until one morning I arrived at the house to find her curled up on the bathroom floor, asleep, a child's steroidal plumpness at her elbows and her wrists. For weeks, since that part of her brain which governed spatial awareness had begun to fail, she had been unable to dress herself, her knickers having come to represent a geometrical puzzle that she couldn't solve. But now she had lost the ability to navigate from one room to another, becoming confused in doorways, turning herself in odd directions. Although she still recognized the house, although she said that nothing really looked any different to her, and although she still knew that, for example, the kitchen was on the left of the living room and the bathroom at the top of the stairs, when she tried to translate this knowledge into action, it confounded her. That mental construct which she had of the house we had lived in for the entirety of my life, the two of us echoing backwards through the sheltering closeness of its rooms, our arguments, our gestures of anger, and our reconciliations, our particular celebrations, and our daily grinding still present in the marks across the walls and floors, the ghost stains on the carpets, the wonky handle to the study door. This no longer bore any relation to the space through which she moved, the fact of it unparsable, even while her memory of it remained clear and detailed. Her body, too, had become strange to her, its shape no longer matching the map she had of it, so that her idea of where she was in space floundered and was unreliable and any movement was a conscious effort of attention, a matter of watching, pushing her body about, as though it were mere mechanism, while elsewhere, on an empty plane, its mental analogue moved freely through a steady silence. The following day I packed up my room in the Elephant and Castle flat and moved home, stuffing my belongings into a hold-all and, when that was full, into plastic carrier bags. I took a taxi to the station, and then at last I found myself going in the same direction as everyone else, sat as the evening rush hour began in the corner of a commuter train on top of my unwieldy pile of things. Changing at Clapham Junction, one of my bags split, sending a cascade of jumbled paperbacks and underwear slithering down into the gap between the train and the platform to settle on the tracks. 
I stood in the crowd of homing workers, my dirty jeans and high tops squalid amongst the multitude of suits and brogues. The remaining bags slouched about my legs, and I watched the trains run again and again across my things. And if, afterwards, I was unable to see quite how deeply grief ran, if I felt I had no right to my unhappiness, then in part I think it was because I was ashamed that this last journey home was one that I had made not out of love, nor even from compassion, but only from expediency, because it was necessary, and because there was no one else to do it. I just find that really powerful writing. I will never forget that scene, though that that passage is about the mother losing her sense of spatial awareness in the house, and and the daughter moving back home and having her belongings tumble out onto the track. My God! But I couldn't just pick out a few sentences to show you. All of the book is like that, like page and a half scenes or uh, passages but really enjoying it. Now, as Eric said in his review, the other part of this book is the narrator's preoccupation with two scientists from, the, I believe, the late 19th century. One was the founder of the X-ray and the other was the founder of an animated film, like moving pictures. And that's interesting too, but I don't see so far how they fit together other than that the narrator is fascinated by it and she feels a strong personal tug to these this research I don't see it yet so that may end up being something that I don't like by the end but I hope that it all comes together because I'm really enjoying this I also started on audio Manhattan Beach by Jennifer Egan and just last night made an arrangement with Chris of Chris Bookish Cauldron to do an impromptu buddy read because he's reading it too. I'm doing it on audio and he's, I think he's doing the text and we're going to buddy read it from here on in. So that'll be great. I'm enjoying it. It's a historical novel set in the depression era of Manhattan where that's when the story starts. I'm, I'm not sure about it, but I'm, I'm enjoying it. The characters are well drawn. The writing's great. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, apparently the main character ends up becoming some kind of a diver. Haven't got to that part yet, but I think that's just around the corner. So far, so good. And that's also on the women's prize list. Because of a bail, I rather impulsively pulled one off the shelf, and this is what I pulled off the shelf. Barren Lives by Graciliano Ramos. This is a Brazilian novel. Apparently it's a classic within the Brazilian literary canon. 1938, translated, obviously. It's about 130 pages, and it's about a peasant family during a drought, or that's how the story opens, and the writing is really vivid. I'm enjoying it. It's early, but I've read about 20 pages, but it's not one that anybody else is talking about on BookTube, I don't think. And I picked this up uh, in a used bookstore a few months back, and give it a try. I love having that freedom to just, oh, I want to read something. And, uh, which book is kind of beckoning to me? Okay, let's go. Without any forethought, so. And finally... I was delighted to find out that on, on its publication day, the novel from the Nigerian-American writer Uzo Dimma Iwiala, his new novel, Speak No Evil, is on script, so I started listening to it just yesterday. So I just listened to it. maybe only part of the first chapter. It's a wonderful audio narrator who tends to do a lot of the male point of view audiobooks from Nigeria. <laughs> the story so far it's way too early but it, it's a gay novel there aren't so many from africa not including south africa so i'm quite stoked to see how that goes so those are my new books and like everybody else have been quite preoccupied with the women's prize long list stay tuned for that video but it's just just my own opinion about stuff it's not me setting myself up to be a real commentator on the list the way other experts do it and I had fun doing the vlog uh, about buddy reading The Sense of an Ending by Julian Barnes with Leah of Hide and Seek. And, and it was really fun to do it as a vlog and put, put it all together. But I pronounced vlog wrong. The first time I used the word on one of my early booktube videos, immediately corrected myself. Everybody in the comment section said, oh, we love <laughs> the way you mispronounce that. So then I started doing it 
ironically, you know, knowingly, and now throughout the, the vlog video the other day, I did it completely unknowingly, so I'm just going to go with it. You guys can call it a vlog if you want, but I'll call it a vlog. On that happy note, I've got things to do today, so that's all for now. What are you up to reading-wise or otherwise this fine Friday? It's not so fine. I really wanted to do these videos outside like last weekend, but it's been pouring rain since yesterday. I think tomorrow's supposed to be a nice sunny day, and I don't have any plans, so stay tuned for some sunny outdoor videos coming down the pipe. Thanks for watching.